you may wonder what you could do by yourself for Israel, so let me encourage you by telling you of two young ladies who lived in the northwest part of London, which is crowded with Jewish people. And these two young ladies wanted to do something for them and uh, wrote me a short letter and said, would you come and speak in our church to a joint meeting of Christians and Jews? And uh, I wrote back and said, no, I won't, not in a church. But if you can find some neutral territory where we could meet, I'll come. So they went hunting around northwest London. None of the schools were available. It was examination time. None of the cinemas were available. None of the theaters were available. The town hall locally was booked. There was just nowhere. So they telephoned me and said, we can't find a neutral building, but will you come if it's in the church? And I said, no, I'm sorry, I won't. We must meet on neutral ground if we're going to meet together. It's not a one-way business. So uh, these two girls prayed. And they asked the Lord to show them what to do. And they had a Bible and they opened it up. And the first words they read were these. And Abraham pitched his tent by the oaks of memory. So they said, right, we need a tent. But where are the oaks? And this was in the middle of London. So they set off to find some oak trees. And they walked all around northwest London. They finished up in a small park, which was triangular in shape, and it had an oak tree at each corner or angle of the triangle. And in between was a large grass area. So they uh, immediately went and booked a tent seating 500 people. And then they telephoned me and said, we've found the neutral territory. We've got a tent seating 500. I said, have you, well, where is it? And they said, it's going to be in the park. And I said, that's a public park. You won't be able to put it up there. You'll have to ask for permission first. So they went and didn't get it. But they booked the tent and paid for it and said, you must come. They never did get permission to put the tent up in the park because it never came through in time. But the official in charge of that park said, Oh, he said, I would just step out in faith. This was the official who said that. So they put the tent up. And then they said, how do we let people know? Well, I said, just print some little cards that we request, or just friends of the Jewish people, request the pleasure of your company in the marquee or the tent at such and such a place on such and such a date uh, to hear David Paulson speak on it is time for Gentiles to repay their debt to the Jews. That's all they put. And they started printing them. And they gave a few out. Within days, they had to install an extra telephone to cope with the inquiries. And rabbis were ringing up and saying, may we come? May we bring our synagogue? And it was soon obvious that the tent would be far too small. So they booked a larger tent seating 1,100 and telephoned me to say so. And then they said, we feel the Lord wants us to put on a kosher meal for 1,100 people in the tent. Well, I said, you carry on. Now, this was about two weeks ahead of the time. And these two young ladies were the only ones so far who'd caught the vision. But it went ahead. And it was in Margaret Thatcher's constituency. And when word got to our Prime Minister that this was happening, she wanted to be in on it. She couldn't actually come on the night, but she sent a special letter to us. And on the night itself, we had an assurance that the weather would be right. And the sun broke out at 7.30 in the evening after days and days of rain. The police said we can't defend the tent. It's in the middle of one of the most difficult areas. The National Front is strong. That's a kind of a resurgent fascist movement. And uh, the PLO has a presence here. The synagogues are getting their windows broken. And we will not defend that tent. Well, now there were thousands of pounds worth of canvas there. And these two young ladies 
were the only ones responsible. But they still went ahead and they protected it with the hosts of the Lord. Not one policeman came near us, nor did anyone come near us to cause trouble. It was right in the middle of a very populated area where there's lots and lots of trouble. So we had 1,100 Christians and Jews together in one tent, and uh, I spoke, and Mervyn Merler Watson came specially over to sing, and uh, two of the leading rabbis of London came, in particular a rabbi, John Hardman, who's one of the top two in Britain, and he responded after I'd spoken. In fact, he said a moving thing. He held up a photograph of himself in army uniform, standing at the edge of a grave in which there were the remains of 10,000 Jewish people. He was an army chaplain with the British Army at the liberation of the concentration camps. And he held that photograph of himself up, and this is what he said. Tonight, for the first time since 1945, I have hope. It was devastating. And then we broke up the formal part of the meeting and I saw Christians and Jews together in beautiful harmony, trusting each other. There wasn't a trace of any suspicion or hostility. We had our kosher meal. It was one of the most glorious evenings. A week later, it was a large ceremony in London called Trooping the Colour, which the Queen attends, and uh, the Prime Minister was sitting in the front row of um, the special seats for the government, and a, a little bird told me that all she talked about that day as she watched the Trooping of the Colour was a meeting that somebody had held for Jews and Christians together in her constituency a few days before. And it all started with two young ladies who had a bit of faith. So I would just encourage you to believe you could do something if it's in your heart. And the results of that one meeting have literally sent ripples around the Jewish community throughout our country and beyond. And if you'd like to listen to what was said by both myself and the rabbi on that evening, then you're more than welcome to ask for the tape. And I want to say this, that I didn't play that game of hiding Jesus on that occasion because I believe honesty is the basis of friendship. And I said it's strange, but it is the, the one who divides us at the moment who is the one who will unite us. It's an embarrassment to both you Jewish people and us Christian people that Jesus is Jewish. It's embarrassing to you because you'd like to disown him. It's embarrassing to us because we can't disown you. But this person who is an embarrassment to us both, because he is Jewish, is the one who will unite us both. So I didn't hesitate to tell them. And I just found that the honesty of that was not resented, but was welcomed. And we finished up that night with a tent just full of friends. Well, now, I want to read a passage first from the Old Testament. Uh, I was reminded of it by one of the songs we've just sung, and I just glanced at it in my Bible. It's such a beautiful passage. I want to read it to you. I love reading the Bible aloud, do you? How many of you believe it's the most important book you could ever read? How many of you have read it? No, all of it. Keep your hands up, please. That's not quite as many hands as went up the first time. Don't ever say it's the most important book to read if you haven't read it. Right through from Genesis or Generation to Revolution, as somebody said. Do you know we once read the Bible right through non-stop aloud in our church? We used the Living Bible because it was easy to read. But we started on a Sunday night at 9 o'clock and we finished at, on Thursday morning at breakfast time. We just read it straight through aloud, cover to cover. Everybody just read 15 minutes, nobody read twice. 
and all through the night and day there were people reading. It's a wonderful thing to do. We didn't know what effect it would have, but we had an aggregate of 2,000 people attended and we sold half a ton of Bibles. So you might like to try it sometime. That was in England. Right, well let me read from the book of Jeremiah and chapter 33, which was the passage from which one of those songs we just sang came. Verse 10 of chapter 33 goes like this. This is what the Lord says, You say about this place, it is a desolate waste, without men or animals. Yet in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are deserted, inhabited by neither men nor animals, there will be heard once more the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom, and the voices of those who bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord, saying, Give thanks to the Lord Almighty, for the Lord is good. His love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of this land as they were before, says the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says, In this place, desolate and without men or animals, in all its towns there will again be pastures for shepherds to rest their flocks. In the towns of the hill country, of the western foothills and of the Negev, in the territory of Benjamin, in the villages around Jerusalem and in the towns of Judah, flocks will again pass under the hand of the one who counts them, says the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the gracious promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord our righteousness. For this is what the Lord says, David will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, nor will the priests who are Levites ever fail to have a man to stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings to burn grain offerings and to present sacrifices. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that day and night no longer come at their appointed time, then my covenant with David my servant and my covenant with the Levites who are priests ministering before me can be broken. And David will no longer have a descendant to reign on his throne. I will make the descendants of David my servant and the Levites who minister before me as countless as the stars of the sky and as measureless as the sand on the seashore. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Have you not noticed that these people are saying the Lord has rejected the two kingdoms he chose? So they despise my people and no longer regard them as a nation. This is what the Lord says. If I have not established my covenant with day and night and the fixed laws of heaven and earth, then I will reject the descendants of Jacob and David my servant and will not choose one of his sons to rule over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. For I will restore their fortunes and have compassion on them. Do you hear God's heart in those words? It's a heart that is loyal. One of the reasons that Israel is still on the map is this, that God hates divorce. And he married Israel. That's why they're still around. Now there's a passage from the New Testament I want to read as well and then we'll talk together. It's the first eight verses of Acts chapter 1. How many of you were at Jerusalem with us just now at the feast? One, two, three, four, five. Good, well, shalom. <laughs> 
But I feel tonight I want to pick up some of the threads of what I was saying there and expand them for a particular reason. Those of us who have found our hearts opened toward Israel by the Holy Spirit, found ourselves loving the Jewish people, which is not a natural thing for me to do. I wouldn't have done that. It's only because God has shed abroad His love in our hearts that we find ourselves loving His people. That's the only explanation I can give, because it's not something that comes naturally, but it comes supernaturally. And those of us who found our hearts opened need to commend that same love to the rest of the Church of Christ. And we need to do it by having a biblical balance in our understanding of Israel. And I want to try and help you tonight to have that if you haven't already got it so that you can give to other people a good scriptural reason for the hope that's in you concerning his ancient people. It is not enough to have enthusiasm. It's not enough to have interest. If we're going to commend our love for Israel to the rest of the body of Christ, then we must have God's word for what we do. So let me read the first eight verses of Acts. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's one of the most important scriptures in the New Testament concerning the question we're about. Let's just pray. Father, I ask now for the help of your Holy Spirit that we may love you with all our mind and really think things through carefully. But may that also be matched with a love for you with all our soul and might and strength and just everything so that what we understand may be translated into action. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well now, between the resurrection of Jesus and the ascension of Jesus, he spent six weeks instructing them on one subject, the kingdom of God. And there isn't a word of it recorded in my Bible. I'm so frustrated. Wouldn't you love to have a record of what he taught them concerning the kingdom? For six weeks he gave them Bible study. He hadn't done that before. And for the first time, he took them through the scriptures, through the law, the Psalms, the prophets, all the writings. And he took them carefully through the Bible, and he spoke to them on the one subject of the kingdom of God. Which raised a question. It was the same theme with, with which he'd begun three years earlier. And the one theme that ties together the whole of our Lord's ministry was the kingdom of God. His very first sermon was on that subject and so was his last. And a lot in between. Now he never once defined the kingdom of God. He never once told us what it was. 
He described it many times, but he never defined it. And the reason he never defined it was simple. Every Jew knew what he meant. He didn't need to define it. When he said the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, they knew what he was talking about. And so there's no definition. But we today have to have a definition. And so I just want to tell you that for the Jewish people, the phrase the kingdom of God meant two things, one general and one special. The general meaning was simply the restoration of the rule on planet earth of the king of the universe. The day when the king of the universe would again rule planet earth and everybody would obey his rule and live under his reign. That's what they meant generally when the kingdom of God was mentioned. But the particular meaning they also had when they heard the word kingdom was that they thought of the king of the Jews whom God had promised to send to Jerusalem to reign. So they thought of the king of universe reigning over the planet earth, that was the general meaning, and they thought of the king of the Jews reigning over Israel, that was the special meaning. And they had a connection in their minds between the two. And they believed that when the right king of the Jews was reigning in Jerusalem, then God's rule could be established throughout the earth. Indeed, they believed from the prophets that when that king was reigning in Zion, that all the other nations would come to Jerusalem to find out how to operate, how to disarm, how to ban the cruise missiles, how to turn their swords into plowshares. They believed from the prophets that if the king of the Jews could reign in Jerusalem, all the nations would come and God's reign would extend to the whole of planet earth. So you see the connection between the general and the special. And when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God being near, they expected both those things to happen. But they expected them to happen in this order, that the king of the Jews would establish his reign in Jerusalem, and then the whole earth would come, and come under the reign of God. That's what they expected. But Jesus never mentioned publicly the reign of the king of the Jews over Israel. And that was the problem. During the three years of his ministry, he concentrated almost exclusively on the individual aspect of the kingdom of heaven. He spoke about a man or a woman finding out about it. He concentrated almost exclusively on finding individual subjects for that kingdom. And he didn't find many who were willing to come under the king's reign. And all the time he was talking about individuals entering the kingdom, seizing the kingdom, living under God's reign, the people were thinking about he would make a jolly good king of Israel. And they tried more than once, especially after he gave them a good feed. He fed 5,000 with a couple of fish and five loaves, and they said, you're the king we want. <laughs> you're exactly what we're looking for. And they tried to make him king, and he refused. And time and time again they hoped that he would be the national king, and all he wanted, apparently, was to be the king of individuals to reign in their lives. So for three years he spoke about the individual aspect of the kingdom of heaven. They wanted the national. Then after his resurrection he returned to the theme of the kingdom of God. But this time he instructed them about the international aspect. And what little we've got of what he said during that period is about all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go and preach to every creature. And he was just seeing a whole world brought into the kingdom. So he switched from the individual aspect during the three years to the international aspect during that six weeks. And still he didn't talk about being king of Israel. So the disciples had a discussion. If you read Acts 1, it, it clearly indicates that the disciples got in a little huddle and they said, why hasn't he mentioned Israel yet? 
Why isn't there anything about the national? He's talked about the individual, he's talked about the international, but there's nothing about the nation. And they got together and finally it says they came to him together and they all asked him the one question. It wasn't one of the disciples who asked him, it was all of them. And they knew they didn't have him much longer. They didn't know that it would be the very last question they could ask. Supposing you could only ask Jesus one question, what would you ask? If he just was here tonight and said, you can all ask me one question, then I'm going back to Father. What would you ask him? He'd already said, stop clinging to me, I haven't yet ascended to the Father. I'm going to Father, I'm going back home. They knew they hadn't much longer, so they waited on him. Actually, it was on the Mount of Olives, and they didn't know he was just about to say goodbye. But they said, we have a question. How come you haven't mentioned Israel yet? Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now that's a question that they asked 2,000 years ago and for about 2,000 years people have not been asking it. But since 1948 Christians all over the world have started asking the same question again. Lord, at this time, in our lifetime, now, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel? Since 1948 when the state of Israel was founded and 1967 when Jerusalem came back under Jewish government, Hundreds, indeed thousands of Christians around the world have been asking the same question the disciples asked. Has the time come? I want to look first at the question that the disciples asked 2,000 years ago, what they meant by it, and what Jesus' answer meant. And then we're going to come right up to date and we're going to say, now that we're asking the same question, is it the same answer or is it a different answer today? That's my theme for tonight. All right? So uh, may the Lord give you concentrating power to keep with me as we really dig deep into the scriptures tonight. Just a few. Because I believe that our interest in Israel and our thoughts about Israel must be established from the New Testament. You can establish a whole lot of things from the Old Testament on its own. But we've got a whole Bible, and I believe that Christians must read the Old Testament with New Testament spectacles on. And that if we do not see confirmed in the New what the Old seems to promise, then we've got to raise a question. But if we do find New Testament confirmation, how strong a base that gives us to talk to other Christians about the hope that's in us. Well, now, they were on the Mount of Olives, and that's quite significant for three reasons. First of all, it was their favorite place for asking him questions about the future. If you read Matthew 24 or Mark 13 or Luke 21, Jesus answered all kinds of questions about the future. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? And it was on the Mount of Olives that he used to teach them about the future. And we know everything about the future we need to know. There are many things we don't know, but we know everything we need to. And Jesus told us the future. I don't know if you realize that this book is packed with predictions about the future. One quarter of the verses of the Bible contain a prediction. Did you know that? A quarter. And altogether there are 735 separate future events predicted in this book. 735. Some of them are predicted many times. One of them, 300 times. But there are 735 separate predictions in my Bible about the future. How many have come true? 596 have already happened. That's about 80%, just over 80%. Now that doesn't mean the Bible is 80% right and 20% wrong because most of the others are connected with the end of the world. So I wouldn't have expected them to be fulfilled yet. There are less than 20 to be fulfilled before Jesus gets back. Out of 735, less than 20 remain to be fulfilled before Jesus returns. That's amazing. Why do people read their horoscope? Much better guide to the future here, and it's been proved 100% reliable. 
Now on the Mount of Olives, they asked Jesus again and again about the future. They said, what's going to happen? When will it happen? How will it happen? How will we know when it's going to happen? And he always told them the truth. Because he was the truth. Jesus never left anyone in misunderstanding. A teacher doesn't do that. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. That's one of the loveliest things Jesus ever said. If it were not so, I would have told you. He wouldn't leave you in any doubt. If you were working with a false hope or a wrong idea, Jesus wouldn't leave you with that. Because it's, there's no comfort in a lie. There's no comfort in an illusion. There's only comfort in the truth. The second reason why I think the Mount of Olives is significant is because it was from there that he set off on a donkey to ride into Jerusalem and they thought he was going to take the throne and reign. But he had already made it perfectly plain to them that the Son of Man had to suffer and then enter into his glory. So now they're saying to him, Lord, you have suffered, enter into your glory. Shall we get the donkey again? Let's nip over the hill to Beth again, get the donkey, and you can ride in now and be king. Are you going to do it now? Because you've suffered now. You can have your glory now. You see, they're reliving Palm Sunday. They're saying, come on, Lord, do it now. We'll get the donkey for you, we'll ride into town, and you can be king. There's a third reason why the Mount of Olives is significant. Because the prophet Zechariah said, the Messiah's feet will stand on the Mount of Olives and in that day he will be king over the whole earth. And here they are standing on the Mount of Olives. They're saying, what's stopping you? You can be king of Israel today and then the king of the universe can begin to reign all over the world and the nations will come to the mountain of the Lord. That's the meaning of their question. I don't think they were just asking, will you restore national sovereignty to Israel and get rid of the Romans? I believe they were seeing the national restoration of the kingdom as the step to the international establishment of God's reign. They were asking him, are you going to do it now? Now behind every question there are always assumptions. Written into every question are what we call premises. And if the premises are wrong, you must question them. For example, if you buttonholed me outside the door there and you said to me, have you stopped beating your wife, David? There's an assumption in that question. Do you follow me? And I'm really backed into a corner. I can't say yes or no, can I? Because if I say yes or no, I'm accepting your assumption that I'm a wife beater. So I will not answer your question yes or no, I'll say I don't beat my wife. I'll challenge your question. Do you follow me? Supposing they'd come to Jesus and said, Jesus, are you at this time going to assassinate Pilate and Herod? And he had replied, it's not for you to know the time set for that. What would you assume from his answer? That he accepted their question. Do you follow me? Now listen, there are four assumptions in their question here. Four clear assumptions and Jesus challenges none of them. Assumption number one, Israel once had the kingdom. You can't restore what a person never had. Number two, Israel has lost the kingdom. Number three, Israel is going to get it back again. And number four, you, Jesus, are the one who will give it to them. Do you follow me? Every one of those four assumptions are in the question. Israel had the kingdom. Israel has lost it. Israel is going to get it back again. And you are the one who will give it to them. And Jesus accepted all four assumptions. Do you notice that? That is one of the most solid foundations in the New Testament for our belief that God has not finished with his people Israel and will restore the kingdom to them. If Jesus was an honest teacher and they were laboring under a false hope and a false understanding of his teaching, he should have said the kingdom will not be restored to Israel. It's going to be passed on to others permanently now. 
He was impatient with the disciples from time to time. There were times when Jesus said, How long am I going to be with you? Oh, you foolish people, men of little faith, when will you learn? Time and again Jesus expressed almost impatience with the disciples that they were so thick. But he doesn't do that here. He says, it's not for you to know the time. That's an incredible answer if you think it through. He is saying, yes, Israel once had the kingdom. Yes, they have lost the kingdom. Yes, they will get it back again. And yes, I will give it to them. Now those are four tremendous, solid facts on which we built. The only thing that he didn't tell them was when. And I've noticed that Jesus did that all the way through his ministry. Whenever they asked him what will be the sign and when, he always told them what but never when. Did you ever notice that? He would never commit himself to dates or times. And the reason? He said, I don't even know. Of that day or of that hour no man knows, neither the angels nor the Son, but Father only. There are certain things that God the Father keeps in his own hands and doesn't even put in his Son's hands. And the main thing that the Father keeps in his own hands is the timing. It's the Father who determines the times, not the Son. And therefore, when Jesus was asked about the future, he said, I'll tell you what will happen, but I won't tell you when. But of course, our curiosity loves to know when, don't we? Supposing I had the gift of tremendous prophecy tonight and was able to tell you, I know the day, the date you're going to die. And if you ask me at the doors, you leave, I'll tell you. Now, I can certainly say you're going to die. Unless the Lord gets back first. But supposing I could tell you when, would you want to ask me as you leave? Would it cheer you up? Just lift your spirits to know when? I mean, it might be a long way ahead. Would that cheer you up so that each year you could celebrate your death day as well as your birthday? Would you like that? Listen, it is not good for us to know when. We need to know what but not when. And that's terribly, terribly important. What, but not when. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons. But there's one little word in there that I love. It says, which the Father has set. Do you realize that Jesus is saying in Father's calendar the date for restoring the kingdom to Israel is already set. It's set. But it's not for you to know what the Father has set in his diary. So I am absolutely sure as I stand here that one day the kingdom will be restored to Israel. But I cannot tell you when. And I want you not to listen to people who try to tell you when. If Jesus couldn't tell us, nobody else can. Well now, that's uh, perhaps begun to lay a foundation. But the answer which Jesus gave was positive as well as negative. He not only said it is not for you to know, he also said it is for you to get filled with the Spirit and get on with your business. And that is the other half of the answer. It goes together and we sometimes split it up. The answer to their question, when will you do it, is it is not for you to know that, but it is for you to do this. There is a positive answer. And the positive answer is, get filled up with the Spirit, be my witnesses, here in Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth. And every part of that positive side of the answer comes out of the second half of the prophet Isaiah. Did you know that? You read through Isaiah chapters 40 to 66 and again and again four themes will occur. The pouring out of his spirit. The spirit of the Lord being put on people. 
You shall be my witnesses. That phrase keeps occurring. You shall be my witnesses. Jerusalem, bringing good tidings to Jerusalem, occurs again and again. And the phrase, the ends of the earth, keeps occurring in those chapters. All those four themes. The Spirit coming on people. You be my witnesses. Good tidings to Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth. Underline those four themes in the second half of Isaiah and you'll realize that Jesus is simply saying you get on with fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. But there is one very big change. It is a huge change. It is a reversal, a rearrangement of the order in which God is going to do it. Now to me this is uh, something I, I want to tread very carefully into because I don't want you to misunderstand me. God knew from the beginning what was going to happen, what he'd have to do. But from the human angle, there is a change of plan. Plan A was to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem and have the Gentiles come to Jerusalem to get in that kingdom. Plan B was to go to the Gentiles with the kingdom first and bring the kingdom to Israel later. That's the big change from the prophecies of Isaiah to Jesus' answer to their question. And it is a change, and I'll tell you why the change occurred. Jesus himself told a parable not long before he died in which the owner of the vineyard sent servants to get fruit and then a son to get fruit and they wouldn't give the fruit. And so what was the owner going to do? Jesus said, ask the crowd, what should the owner do? And they said, well, he should get another tenant to get him fruit. And he said, the kingdom will be taken from this people and given to a people producing the fruits of it. Change of plan. Now, many people have made the mistake of thinking that that change of plan implies that the Jewish people are out of God's plan, out of his purpose, that he's found a new Israel called the church who've taken over and they're going to do the whole job. But that is not what Jesus was saying. He was saying the Father has set the time for the restoration of the kingdom to Israel, but it's not yet. There's a job for you to do first. Instead of the nations coming to Jerusalem, you go to the nations with the message of the kingdom and establish it among the Gentiles. And Paul's teaching agrees entirely with the Lord Jesus when he says, when the fullness of the Gentiles is coming, then the first part of the plan can be put back into the picture and all Israel can be saved. Now, that's the positive side of the answer. Instead of nations will come, his orders were, you go. That's been the mandate for the church ever since. But I want you to notice that he did not exclude Jerusalem or Judea from that task. And our task is to be his witnesses by the power of the Spirit in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The center is clear, Jerusalem. The circumference is also clear, the ends of the earth. And we have to keep both in mind. There are some Christians who go to the ends of the earth but forget about Jerusalem. There are others who go to Jerusalem and forget about the ends of the earth. But the mandate of Jesus is take the kingdom, the good news, to all those places. Begin right here and end out there but take the gospel of the kingdom all. this means then that the kingdom will be established among the Gentiles before it's restored to Israel that's God's revised version of his plan of course he knew all the time he'd have to have the revised version but from our angle and the Bible is presented to us in terms we can understand the kingdom had to be taken from that nation and given to a people who would produce the fruit of it. Well now let me come to the question that we are asking today. 
in the last 30 years, all over the world, people have started asking this question again. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And what has sparked off that question is, of course, the return of the Jews to the Middle East. You can't ignore that. Actually, I did in 1948. It never hit me. Because then I, I, I had no concept of God's continuing love for the Jews. I confess it with shame. I thought the church had completely taken over and he'd washed his hands off them, done a Pontius Pilate on them, and that was it. I didn't know God as well as I know him now. I know him well enough now to know this. I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what about the Jews? Did you ever notice that Paul didn't write chapter 9 in there? The chapter numbers and verse numbers in the Bible are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. I wish we could get Bibles without them. We'd have to know our Bibles much better than we do. For a thousand years, Christians had to cope with the Bible with no chapter and verse numbers. You try preaching or teaching the Bible without using chapter and verse numbers and you're a real good Bible teacher. Anyway, after 2,000 years, they've come home. From 72 nations, they've returned. They're there. And suddenly we became aware of it. I became aware of it in 1967, actually. I'll tell you why. In 61, I'd gone out to Israel. It had been a lifetime's ambition. And I went out. And I went out with a camera to get slides for Bible teaching. Amazing how many people go out for that reason. I thought it was one vast open-air museum. I was a bit upset that there were people living there. It's amazing, you know, how people go to Israel and they come back and say, terribly commercialized. There was actually a man selling postcards on the Mount of Olives. As if a man had no right to be earning, earning his living on the Mount of Olives. You'd be amazed. People think it should have been kept as a vast open air museum and kept just as it was in Bible days so we could get nice pictures to take home to Sunday school. And I went for that reason. I wanted to see the places that I'd read about. That's all I went for. And I went and I came back and I, that's all I saw. Yeah, I did find some people living there. And I had a few interesting thoughts about them, but it didn't dawn. I just went to study the past. And I'm afraid the majority of people who go to Israel go for that reason. To study the past. It's a marvelous place to do that. In 1967, I got a whole group of church members ready to take them to Israel to do the same thing and get slides for their Sunday school class. Only we had booked the trip for the month of end of June, 1967. And suddenly, war. And my sole concern was, help, will we get out to Israel or not? What an awful thing to have happened just when we were about to go and visit the place. So I watched the television for six days to see if it would clear up before we get, went out. And I saw God's hand in history. Never forget it. I began to see things. I said, God, that, that, that's got to be you. That couldn't have just happened at the human level. It's impossible. And a Sunday came in the middle of that six-day war, and I preached a sermon that Sunday. Because in a flash, God showed me the whole thing. And to my astonishment, tapes of that sermon went right round the world. They went into synagogues, into Jewish schools, and it was only a matter of days since I'd seen it all. One went to Mrs. Golda Meir. Went all over the place. And I thought, what? It, was like, it was like putting a plug in an electric socket and realizing it was switched on. Do you know what I mean? Everything was there straight away. And we went out straight after the end of the Six Day War. I remember going up into the Galan Heights and saying to a major, how did you ever get up these heights with all these Russian guns pointing down at you? How did you do it? How could you take it? I'll never forget his reply. He didn't say a word. He just did this. 
That was before Israel fell into pride and thought they'd done it. They were still amazed themselves. But how quickly we take the credit from God. Which they did by 1973 and God humbled them then. Well that was the beginning of it. And so I began to search my Bible, Old and New Testament, to find the explanation of it all. But there have been, I discover, three separate reactions to the events in the Middle East among Christians. There are three groups, the negatives, the neutrals, and the positives. The negatives said, oh, it's, it's a political accident. The negatives said, God has no future for Israel, he's finished with them, it's the church now. That was the negatives, and the majority of Christians are still among the negatives. Then there were the neutrals who said, well, I can see in the New Testament grounds for believing that there is a spiritual future for the Jews, but not, not a political or a physical one. I can't see that. So there are, I meet many Christians who believe that there will be a great spiritual move among the Jewish people worldwide but they can't see a physical or political restoration in the New Testament. And so they say, well, no, the return of Israel to the Middle East, well, it's nice to see them having a home of their own after all they've suffered, but I, I can't see any real significance in that. But I do believe that there will be a spiritual restoration to the Jewish people. Then there is a third group whom I'm calling the positives. And I would put myself among them, who say there is biblical significance in their physical restoration as a preparation for their spiritual restoration. And that therefore there is significance in the events in the Middle East. And my ground for that is both in the Old and the New Testament. I just mentioned very briefly three passages, two from the Old and one from the New. There are many more that I could take. The two from the Old are Jeremiah 31 and Joel chapter 2. You know them. Jeremiah 31 says, I will make a new covenant. And Joel 2 says, I'll pour out my spirit on all kinds of flesh, regardless of age, sex, or class. But in both those cases, promises that are precious to us as Christians, in both cases, if you read the whole chapter in which they're set, first you realize they are promises made to Israel, not to the church, to Israel, and second, they are preceded in both cases by a promise to bring them back to the land and then restore them spiritually. That's a remarkable thing. Jeremiah 31 says, I'll bring you back to the land and I'll make a new covenant with the house of Judah and Israel. Joel 2 says, I'll bring you back to the land and I'll pour out my spirit on all kinds of flesh. But in both cases, a physical restoration to the land precedes the spiritual renewal promised to them. Now I know that in the age in which we live, the kingdom has been taken to Gentiles and we have enjoyed the new covenant and the pouring out of the Spirit. But the original promise is to Israel. And God keeps his word. In fact, at the end of Jeremiah 31, after he promises to make a new covenant with the house of Judah and the house of Israel, he then says, as long as the sun shines and the moon shines and the stars shine, as long as the waves of the sea roll, so long will this people be a nation before me. It's there in the chapter of the New Covenant. But I want to mention now the New Testament passage, which I find many Christians have missed. It's in Romans 11, and it's the end of one verse and the beginning of another. The end. There is a short break in the original master recording at this point, but the verses that David was referring to are as we found in Romans chapter 11, verses 28 and verses 29, reading from the New International Version. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account, but as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. We now rejoin David Pawson. And I read those two phrases recently, and I want to tell you, it, it exploded in my mind. 
the first thing that exploded in my mind was this the patriarchs are not dead I have stood in Hebron underneath the mosque there where you're shown the tombs of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and their wives Sarah, Rebecca and who is the other one? It isn't Rachel, she's buried near Bethlehem I forget but they sh who is it? Pardon? Is it? No? She's buried near Bethlehem Leah it probably is well, whoever it is, there they are, the tombs. And I remember looking at those tombs and saying clearly to myself, they're not dead. Jesus said, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Not was, but is. And God is the God of the living, not the dead. Therefore, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are not dead. Therefore, listen, this, this will blow your mind. The original owners of the Holy Land are still alive. Do you hear what I'm saying? Has that ever hit you before? The, God gave the land to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Gave them the title deeds and they're still alive. And it exploded in my mind. And I thought, they are loved for the patriarch's sake. And the patriarchs are not past, they're present. They're alive now. God is the God of the living, not the dead. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob still own that land. And their descendants own it with them. <laughs> That's mind-blowing. And then I looked at the very next verse where it says, The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. What a strong word. Can never be undone, never taken back. And I asked the second mind-blowing question, what are the gifts? I knew what the calling of Israel was, to be a blessing to every nation on earth. But what were the gifts? So I went back and I read my book of Genesis again. I read right through Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and said, what were the gifts? And there's one gift that stands out above all the others. This land I give to you. And I realized the New Testament said the land can never be taken from them. They own it in perpetuity. The original owners are still alive. And as long as the original owners are alive, the property is theirs and their children's. Do you follow me? And I haven't gone into the Old Testament for that. I've gone into the New Testament. In fact, I couldn't find what the other gifts were. I could only find the land, so that seemed to settle it. Now, I want to draw a distinction at this point between the ownership of the land and the occupation of the land. The ownership is unconditional, but the occupation is conditional. Now, I want you to follow me carefully in this. It has a profound bearing on events in Lebanon right now and the West Bank. The ownership is unconditional. The occupation is conditional. Abraham owned it all, but he didn't occupy any. Isaac owned it all, but he didn't occupy it all. Jacob owned it all, but he didn't occupy it all. And they could not occupy it except on righteous grounds. Now, I want you to hear this very, very important principle. Because some Christians are giving a blank check morally to modern Israel, supporting them whether they're right or wrong, virtually saying they've got a right to take any of that land because it says they don't. Occupation is morally conditioned. Therefore, Abraham, the first bit of the land he actually had for himself, he paid for in hard cash. That's the righteous way to get it. He could have said, God's given me all this. I'll grab that cave and I'll grab that bit and I'll have that. He didn't. He said, could I buy that bit, please? He was a righteous man and he got it righteously. That's quite a point for you to notice. Because it's yours, you don't grab it. You get it righteously. 
Think of the time when Joshua went in and he killed the people in there and he took their towns. But listen, there is a verse in Genesis where God says to Abraham that his descendants would be in slavery in a foreign land and they would only be able to go back to the promised land in the fourth generation because only by then would the wickedness of the Amorites reach its full measure. Now do you hear that? The right that Joshua had to occupy the land was that the people in it were so wicked that death was a fitting punishment. They could not go in and occupy it just because God said it was yours. They could only take it from those who morally were on the wrong side. Now do you follow me here? All the way through the Old Testament the prophets make it quite clear that while the ownership is permanent and unconditional, the occupation of that land is morally conditioned. And that if they started doing the things the Amorites had been doing, they would lose it also. They wouldn't lose ownership, they would lose occupation, they'd lose enjoyment of it. Now do you follow me in this? In fact, that's what sin does. You lose the enjoyment of things that belong to you, right? And that's God's moral government. And the day came when the prophets, Jeremiah, Hosea, Amos, they said, you forfeited your right to occupy this land. You're going to get out of it. But whenever they said that, they always in the same context said, but you'll get it back again because it's yours. Isn't that amazing? You'll be thrown out of it, but you will return because it's yours. That's God's moral government. And the bearing of that on Israel today is this. Israel does not have a right to march into the West Bank and grab land if it belongs to Arabs. The occupation must be righteous. An invasion of Lebanon must be seen to be righteous. And we had the strange spectacle recently when Lebanon blew up of Christians giving unquestioning support to Israel while a lot of Jews around the world were questioning whether it was right. It's a strange position. But listen, friends of Israel, true friends of Israel, will remind Israel that the occupation must be righteous. There are laws about the treatment of aliens and strangers within the land which still apply. There is no moral or spiritual immunity to modern Israel because they own the land. Indeed, I would go further and say the world rightly expects a higher moral standard from Israel than from other peoples. That's part of their problem. They hate it. They wish that we'd judge them by everybody else's standards, but we don't. We do not expect Israel to behave like the PLO. That's why it's not just anti-Semitism that made the world give such publicity to the massacre for which the Jewish people were indirectly responsible and no publicity to the massacre for which the PLO had already been responsible within Lebanon. It's not just anti-Semitism. It was that people say, you Jewish people, if you are the chosen people, we expect you to act righteously. Now in the earlier conflicts of Israel with her Arab neighbors, there was a wide sympathy in the Western world because there was the feeling that it was a question of right rather than might. But now that Israel is the fourth largest military force in the world, coming only behind Russia, America and China, Israel is the fourth most powerful force in the world. People are beginning to ask, is Israel acting on might rather than right? Watchmen on the walls of Israel do not look outward to Israel's enemies, but inward to Israel's morality. Did you know that? I've got a ring on my finger. It's, it's gold. It was made by a, a jeweler in Israel. And if you saw it closely, it's, it's made up of little sort of stones that are cut square. It's, it's a reproduction of the western wall of the temple. And on the top are three letters, DVD. David, my name, which means beloved, as was already said. And uh, that ring is 
meant to be a watchman on the walls of Jerusalem. I wear that to remind me that God wants watchmen on the walls of Israel. But if you read Ezekiel, you'll find that a watchman on the walls of Israel is not to look out and watch for enemies, PLO or anybody else. He's to look in and say, Israel, that is not righteous. A true friend is someone who pulls you up. Someone who's willing to reprove you. I'm glad to be here in Vancouver with Barney Coombs here. I count him a friend because he's one of those who does tell me where I'm wrong. Don't always agree, but I, I really do take him seriously when he says that. And he knows I do. But that's a true friend. A true friend of Israel is not someone who will say, Israel, you can grab this, you can do that, and we'll support you all around the world. A true friend of Israel will say, Israel, the occupation is righteous. Must be. The ownership is yours. But the God of righteousness watches how you occupy it. Do you remember Elijah and Ahab? Ahab, you took Naboth's vineyard in an unrighteous way. That's not the way for a king of Israel. Well, now that's the first thing, and it's a sobering thing to say, I know. But a true friend of Israel will do that. You see, the British ambassador to Israel, whom I know personally, I spent some time with him before he went out there. Uh, not a Christian as far as I know, but I felt I ought to spend time with him before he took up that uh, onerous responsibility. But he is there not primarily to tell the world about Israel, but to communicate those whom he represents and what they feel about Israel to Israel. Every embassy must do that and communicate. And there have been times when the British ambassador in a country has to communicate Britain's disapproval and reproof on behalf of his nation. But true friends will do that. Now, one other word of caution, and then I'll finish on a positive note. Can you cope with another ten minutes? Well, if you have a bus to catch, you go. I've just come back from Australia, and I said, if you have a bus to catch, go. And they all laughed. There were no buses there. <laughs> anyway, are the buses here? I think so. I've been on them. Maybe not this time. Another little word of caution, and then a very positive conclusion. The other word of caution is not to overestimate the prophetic significance of Middle Eastern events, in particular 1948 and 1967. I think it's very important that we look at those two dates and see them in true perspective. In May of 1947, the State of Israel was established, and the name Israel was back in the school atlas after a period of 2,000 years out of it. There must have been the hand of God in those events because it was one of the few votes in the United Nations where America and Russia voted together. That must have been God. And when the entire Arab world said we're going to wipe out this little nation and they survived against incredible odds, there must have been the hand of God in that. Do you know one of the principles in the Old Testament laid down for God's people Israel? They must never, says God, have superior weapons to their enemies or they might trust in themselves and not him. They now have superior weapons and they're beginning to trust in themselves. In 1948, they held off six million Arabs with one big gun and bottles full of petrol against tanks. But they prayed then. And God says to them, it's in the Bible, you must never have superior weapons to your enemies. You must trust me. They had to have weapons, but not superior. Might is not right. But what is the significance of 1948? Was it the fulfillment of the prophecy that a nation would be born in a day? No. No. What it did do, it threw open the door of immigration wide. It's a door that had been progressively closed by the British. But now it was flung wide. And that was part of God's purpose, that they might return in larger numbers. But they have not all yet returned. What will have to happen in Canada and America before they'll go back? It makes me tremble when I think of that. But two things I want to say about 1948. Number one, the state is not the nation. 
We tend to use the word nation today too loosely. We use it of states. We talk about United Nations, perhaps because United States has already been grabbed as a title. But a nation is not a state. A nation is an ethnic group, not a political one. When God says you will never cease to be a nation, he didn't mean you will never cease to be a state. He meant you will never cease to be a distinct people. And God's kept his promise for 2,000 years. They've been a nation, a people, different. So 1948 was not the reestablishment of the nation. It was the reestablishment of a state. And it's the nation that God is interested in. And the nation includes the Jews in Vancouver. God deals with nations which are ethnic groups, not political. For example, we talk of the Arab nation, but it covers many states. But you'll hear Arabs talk about the Arab nation, and they mean the Arab people. So the state of Israel is not the nation. It's the nation that God is concerned with. But he does want them back in the right place. It's where he's always dealt with them. The second thing I would say about 1948 is this. The state is not the kingdom. They don't have a king. They'd like to. One of the tensions in Israel at the moment is this. There are two sorts of Jew there. The Western Jew and the Eastern Jew. The Ashkenazi and the Sephardic. And the Ashkenazi has a, dem a democratic ideal of the state. Most of the early leaders, Ben-Gurion, Golda Meir, they were Ashkenazi Jews who wanted a social democracy. But the Sephardic Jews from the East have lived under dictatorships. They've lived in kingdoms under a king. And they want a king again. And they called Begin King Begin. And it was the Sephardic Jews who put Begin in. And they want a kingdom. They want a king. They don't want a president. They don't want a prime minister. They want a king. But they don't have one yet. Israel is not a kingdom. The kingdom is not restored to Israel yet. The stage is set. But it hasn't happened. Now, about 1967, when Jerusalem came back under Jewish government, many Christians, including your preacher tonight, made the mistake of saying the prophecy is fulfilled. Jerusalem will be tr trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Many Christians are preaching and writing books saying that the times of the Gentiles are over now. Time has come to reverse course. Forget the Gentiles. Concentrate on the Jews. Times of the Gentiles have been fulfilled. And I do confess that in some of my earliest tapes on Israel, I saw a connection between 1967 and that verse. Because I, I went into Jerusalem, I went to the Western Wall, just after the Six-Day War. It was running with water as if somebody had thrown a bucket of water at it, and they told me that it was tears. It was human tears running down the Wailing Wall. They'd got it back. But I've looked at the scripture more carefully since and I noticed that what Jesus actually said was Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And I turned to the last book in the Bible and I read the description there of the big trouble that is coming at the end of this age. The great tribulation, the big trouble. And the worst of that trouble will last just three and a half years. And do you know what it says in the book of Revelation? Chapter 11, verse 3, if you want to note it down. It says, Jerusalem will be trampled on by Gentiles for 42 months. The word trampled on does not refer to civil government. It refers to military invasion. And I'm afraid the military invasions of Jerusalem are not over. Their troubles are not over, not yet. I'm sad to have to say that, but it means the times of the Gentiles are not over either. Jerusalem will be trampled on yet again. She's not through. But people say, but surely everything's going to happen quickly now because the Jews are back there. Will it? I just recall that the first exile and the first return brought the Jews back to the promised land just over 400 years before the Messiah's first visit. Their return does not say it's going to happen by next Thursday. I do not know when the kingdom will be restored to Israel. I know it will be when the king returns, because you can't have a kingdom without a king. But of that hour, of the times or the dates the Father has set, I don't know. I know 
that the stage is set and the curtain has begun to lift even the veil in their minds has begun to lift since 1967 the Jews have written over 200 books and pamphlets about Jesus since 1967 the veil is beginning to lift the curtain is beginning to go up on the stage but how long it will take to go up I do not know so here's my positive conclusion the question we are asking the Lord now is the same as the one the disciples asked in Acts 1 Lord are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel and the answer is still the same it is not for you to know but you get filled up with the power of the Spirit and be my witnesses in Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth we have a solemn duty to be witnesses to the Jewish people within the mandate to take the gospel of the kingdom the whole, to the whole wide world there is a special duty to take it to the Jewish people why? you might have thought that Paul went to the Jews first in a place because he had more to go on with them they had some Bible knowledge they were God fearing people but he didn't go to the Jew first for that reason he went to the Jew first because he said I owe them a debt I am debtor to the Jew first then to the Gentile and I'm a Christian and I'm in debt to the Jewish people every one of the 40 authors of the Bible except one was Jewish and that one got his information from Jews so I have a Jewish book here I'd never know God if the Jews hadn't taken the trouble to write down for me what God said to them it was a young Jewish couple who looked after the Son of God when he was too young to look after himself I, I owe a debt the church of which I am by grace a member was started by twelve Jewish men I have a debt to be a witness to Jesus to them but that debt has become much more profound because of the way the church has treated the Jew over two thousand years and that's been my major burden if you listen to some of my tapes that's the burden you'll get the Jews have suffered more from Christians than from anyone else they have suffered more in Christian countries than any Muslim country it's only in the last thirty years that Muslims have persecuted Jewish people for two thousand years it was the Christian countries Germany was a Christian country we need to remember that I was in Johannesburg and I went to the Jewish Museum in Johannesburg I had the privilege of speaking to the leaders of the Zionist Federation in South Africa and I told them about Jesus too but I saw a picture in their museum that was drawn by a lady who was the widow of a man who was destroyed in Auschwitz and the picture was of a German pastor in his robes, in his pulpit pointing with a hateful face at a bunch of Jewish people in front of the pulpit with one hand and pointing to a cross with Jesus on it with the other and saying you did this, get out of here and my heart was sad the two thousand years of Christian history have deepened our debt to the Jew and you can't really talk to them about Jesus or be a witness to Jesus until you're a friend of the nation of Israel not the state, the nation then you have earned the right to talk if they sense that you love them that you love them I've been misunderstood when I say I don't want any Jew to become a Christian because Christian is a Gentile term it's the description of a Gentile believer I just want them to become true Jews and discover their own Messiah that's a different thing don't misunderstand me here but Christian is a Gentile thing I don't want them to become Gentiles I want them to stay Jews and discover their own Messiah and therefore God giving me grace I want to make friends I want to be a friend of God's people because Abraham was a friend of God 
And by the power of the Spirit, I want to be a witness to Jesus in Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth until the day comes which Father has already set for the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. Thank you for listening.